Hello and welcome to The Daily Space. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I am your host, Beth Johnson. And we are here to put science in your brain. Later in the show, we'll be joined by Dr. Frank Marchese of the SETI Institute and Unisteller to talk about their citizen science partnership. But first, let's look at the news. We are pleased to get to start this week out with a good news story about the Hubble Space Telescope. As of December 6th, this little telescope that can is back to full science operations with four active instruments. On October 23, the 31-year-old telescope had gone into safe mode after an error indicated the instruments weren't correctly receiving timing information and had lost a specific synchronization message. The orbiting telescope had to be updated remotely with new software to deal with synchronization errors in a way that allowed the instruments to work. And the updates did the trick. We send our kudos to the NASA and ESA Hubble teams and are so grateful that we will have this workhorse of science for a little bit longer. It seems we can't update you on Hubble without also updating you on JWST. And we have a JWST update. This decades delayed just waiting space telescope has been approved for a December 22nd launch and as of yesterday is fully fueled. Now, to be clear, it is literally the JWST that is fully fueled. The telescope needs to carry its own propellant, hydrazine and a hydrazine mix, so it can make needed course corrections after launch, maintain its position as needed, and repoint the observatory and manage its momentum. This giant and very complex system has 12 different thrusters that allow it to smoothly move. Now that it is fully fueled, the JWST is ready to be mounted on its ride to space in an Ariane 5 rocket and locked away in its protective fairing. Launch remains set for December 22nd. It will take JWST about 30 days to get from Earth to its ultimate destination and to fully unfold and be ready to collect data. With 40 major deployment actions, and over 300 single points of failure, well, be gentle with your astronomer friends over the New Year's. Until we know JWST actually works, there are going to be a lot of frayed nerves. While talk seems to center on the upcoming launch of JWST, the real telescope of interest for me is the Vera Rubin Observatory and its 8.4 meter mirror that will be used to observe the entire night sky every few days. The exact date of first light for this new telescope is somewhat up in the air due to COVID, but when it does become fully operational, there will be vast numbers of new asteroids getting discovered. Rubin Observatory will take its place alongside Neowise and the Zwicky Transient Factory as just one more tool for finding the rocks that could attack from space. To transform a few nights' observations into long-term orbital predictions is the job of software. And for two decades, NASA has been using the Sentry Code at the Jet Propulsion Lab to sort out long-term orbits and possible collisions. While this code is good, it is missing some key abilities, such as the ability to factor in thermal effects, the Yarkovsky effect, that can cause an object to change orbit just by radiating heat. The software also had the troubling inability to predict future encounters after an object made a close approach to the Earth. But for 20-year-old code, Sentry is kind of awesome. But it is time for new code, and NASA is now releasing the Sentry 2 program. According to developer David Farnashia, every time we came across a special case, like asteroids Apophis, Bennu, or 1950 DA, we had to do complex and time-consuming manual analyses. With Sentry 2, we don't have to do that anymore. And just like the original Sentry code, Sentry 2's results will be automatically put on the internet where you can verify, like I did this morning, that at this moment in time, nothing has been found that is on its way to hit us. At least not yet. Before we head to break, we'd like to take a moment to 
acknowledged that a solar eclipse was viewed by a very tiny number of people over the weekend. The moon's shadow briefly touched the Earth, blocking the sun's light and letting folks see the solar corona, while letting spacecraft see our planet with a really cool dark shadow. It's our understanding that tourist trips to see this, even via cruise ship, were largely canceled, but when an eclipse occurs at the edge of the globe, it still has a shadow. All right, that was a terrible play on words. Let's look at some images, which you can see at dailyspace.org. After the break, we'll be back to talk about weird galaxies that somehow have no dark matter. Stay tuned. Some stories in astronomy just keep getting rewritten, and you can actually tell how up-to-date people are by what they think the universe is up to doing. Take galaxies. Once upon a time, admittedly before I was born, folks believed everything in our universe was made of the kinds of atoms and particles that we regularly work with on Earth and experience as part of our furniture and interlopers in our experiments. But when researchers Vera Rubin and Fritz Zwicky studied the motions of rotating galaxies and galaxies and clusters in separate research, they discovered that what they saw didn't match what was going on. The observed stars, gas, and dust just didn't have enough mass to account for all the motions. And thus, over years, astronomers came to accept that our universe is largely constructed of material we can't observe through light. And that stuff makes up a larger portion of our universe than the regular scientifically named baryonic matter. This weird stuff was given the unfortunate name dark matter, and we have been struggling to find it ever since. When I was in grad school, we were taught that the bulk of most galaxies is dark matter. And we even learned how to fit dark matter halos to light distributions to get at the ratio of normal to dark matter for different kinds of systems. Tiny dwarf galaxies? They were found with the largest dark matter ratios. And we struggled to understand what was up with ghostly ultra-diffuse galaxies, which were just starting to be studied in earnest. And 20 years after finishing my last grad class, Researchers are pointing out that at least six ultra-diffuse galaxies just really don't seem to have dark matter. The first paper came out and was led by Pavel E. Mancera Pina in 2019. And it was met with a lot of, I uh, could you look a little harder? There has got to be some dark matter there somewhere. So they looked harder. And in a new paper, again led by Pina, Researchers confirmed, nope, there is no dark matter to be found in at least one ultra-diffuse galaxy that they observed for 40 hours using the Very Large Array in New Mexico. Named AGC 114905, this system is about 250 million light years away, and while it is faint and its stars are few, the VLA was able to resolve its gas and trace out how fast that gas was orbiting as a function of distance from the galactic core. That motion exactly matched what folks like Vera Rubin expected to see when they first started looking at galaxy rotation curves and, well, that we no longer expected to see now that we understand dark matter and this research seems to answer the question, can you have galaxies without dark matter? Yes, the answer appears to be yes, you can. Now, how these systems can form is a mystery. And the possibilities laid out in this latest paper in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society aren't entirely satisfactory. This is one more case of the universe showing it can be far more creative than we are and demonstrating anything is possible with the laws of physics if you just mix things just so. After the break, we're going to be back to take a look at how you can be part of observing our universe as Beth interviews Franck Mar Marchez of the SETI Institute and Unistellar to talk about their citizen science partnership. Welcome back. Joining us now is Dr. Franck Marchese. Frank is a senior planetary astronomer and chair of the 
the Planet Group at the Carl Sagan Center of the SETI Institute, as well as the Chief Scientific Officer and a founder at Unistellar. Unistellar makes the EV Scope, which is a telescope designed for the consumer who wants to see deep sky objects without a lot of astrophotography gear. Most importantly to this show, Unistellar is partnered with the SETI Institute in a citizen science effort to help astronomers collect data on asteroids, comets, and even exoplanets. Thank you, Frank, for joining us today. Hi, Bess. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about the history of Unistellar. How did you become involved in this company? So the project started with me uh, in 2017. I visited the CES and I heard about this uh, group of uh, French entrepreneurs who wanted to create a new type of telescope, a digital smart telescope, an easy to use telescope, kind of the mm -hmm. iPhone of astronomy. Uh, so I joined them and uh, we discussed and I brought the science that we could do with this telescope and the concept of the network that, uh, basically is very um, appealing to the city institute because we started working with citizen scientists a long time ago and now we are bringing this concept of citizen science so people who have a telescope can also do scientific investigation so the program is aimed uh at the actual consumers of uh, the EV scope and not, it's not a general sort of thing, right? The data has to go into the Unistellar network. It's a bit of both. Um, right now we are focusing, of course, on our uh, citizen astronomers. We have 5,000 potential citizen astronomers, even more, uh, distributed uh, around the planet, mostly in the US, Canada, Europe, uh, Japan. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, but we are starting having users around the world in South America, in Asia and in India specifically, and in Africa. So we are taking care of those users, of course, we call them citizen astronomers, as soon they, uh, they start uh, observing more than just enjoying the dark sky, doing scientific investigation. So we send them science to be done with the telescope. But in fact, if you don't have an EV scope, you can also do participate to those campaigns and be part of the, of the observations. We have a public web page where people can see uh, the next campaigns in planetary defense, in um, exoplanets, in uh, situational awareness, uh, etc. We have a lot of different problems. So when you talk about planetary defense how do citizen astronomers uh use your product or use the ev scope or use anything to help with planetary defense well we do know that uh, earth is orbiting around the sun but around the around this uh, orbit there is also a lot of words um we have um i think now a catalog of twenty thousand asteroids which could potentially cross the orbit of our planet we call them near earth asteroid and some of them, called uh, potentially hazardous asteroids, truly cross the orbit of Earth. So the goal is to characterize them. Um, a lot of surveys try to find them, uh, Catalina and so on, for instance, and mm -hmm. soon the Vera Rubin telescope. But in fact, as soon as you find one, you need to follow it. You need to make mm -hmm. sure that you don't lose it because this orbit can change uh, due to interaction with the, with the sun or due to uh, close encounter with a planet. So what we propose to do with the EV-scope is so people observe uh, them when they are bright enough for our telescope. And um, as soon as they get the observation, they send us to our server, the City Institute Stellar. Our researcher here process the observation and send them to the minor planet center. So the orbit is calculated. So for instance, um, in November, we did this for an asteroid. And of course, I'm not going to remember the name of it. Uh, it's 2019 excess. Uh, he, he had a close flyby to um, to Earth. He passed like 1.5 times the moon, moon Earth distance. So it's very close mm -hmm. to us. And it was observable. We realized that uh, quite uh, late uh, for some reasons. So I'm not going to go through the details. But we sent an alert for citizen astronomers. And three of them, one in Japan, one in the US, one in France, observed this asteroid. We measure the position, we send it to MPC, and now we have a, a, a better orbit, basically. And the point, the reason we need to have a, a better orbit is because, of course, we want to know whether or not this asteroid could impact Earth in the future. But we can also have a better orbit so we know how to go to visit this asteroid. 
uh, maybe this asteroid could be a, poten uh, a source of minerals in the future or water for the future civilization that will explore space. And do you have any campaigns coming up to look at any more asteroids right now? Yes, uh, we're going to do Nereus as a flyby in December 11, uh, very soon, Saturday. Uh, and there is another one with a number that I don't remember. It's on our website at uni unistellar.com. Just click at science, citizen science, and you will see them. So we do have multiple campaigns. Typically, we have uh, one to three uh, planetary defense campaigns per month. Okay, well, I want to talk to you some more about uh, other campaigns, but we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Once again, uh, joining me is Dr. Frank Marchis of the SETI Institute and Unicellar, and we are discussing the uh, partnership between the two for a citizen astro set of citizen astronomy campaigns. So one of the things that you talked about a little bit was um, how many, how citizen astronomers can participate for asteroids. But one of the things I find interesting is that you also mentioned doing exoplanets. So how do your exoplanet campaigns work? Have you had a successful one? What's, what's happened with that? Yeah. Um, so exoplanets are planets in orbit around other stars, as you know, and we have discovered 4,000 of them. And in fact, we have, we have a mission, the NASA mission called TESS, which has observed as well 4,000 candidates. So those are test objects of interest. So they're basically potential, uh, potential exoplanet that we need to confirm. Um, so we are using the EVSCOPE network to do these confirmations. Uh, we have, um, we, ch we check continuously new targets coming into the catalog of tests, the TOIs. And when we identify one interesting TOIs, we ask, uh, our users to observe this, uh, this star continuously for three, four hours, so they can detect the attenuation of light uh, from the backyard due to the passage of a planet between us and the host star. So we have wow. done that for, I would say, I just remember yesterday, we have 150 detection already of multiple exoplanets involving more than 80 uh, citizen astronomers. Um, Last week, uh, we did a very special campaign that I want to talk about called uh, for Kepler, a Kepler candidate, a Kepler target, sorry, Kepler 167E. Okay. You probably know this one, I'm sure, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, let me just pull that right out of my memory. <laughs> plug your brain to the internet and you will find <laughs> out. <laughs> so Kepler 167E is what we call a, a cold Jupiter. So it's, an, it's a Jupiter-sized exoplanet in orbit around its star uh, in, with a period of uh, 1,000 days, almost three years, right? Roughly, I don't remember the exact number. Uh, we, this was discovered by Kepler, mm -hmm. re-observed partially by Spitzer, the okay. space telescope. And three years later, uh, we tried to observe it from the ground. And in fact, we have not yet a, a complete uh, analysis of the data, but Tom Esposito, who is a researcher at the SET Institute, who leads the pro this program, uh, sent me a message this morning telling me that, in fact, we have detected uh, using 43 observations taken from 30 different people, from Japan to the US to Europe for uh, 35 hours, roughly. We have a detection wow. of this event. And that's the that... first time this planet is detected from the ground, in fact. That is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so when these kinds of things happen and you have all these citizen astronomers, I know one of the sort of the interesting aspects of citizen science is that people get to get their names on research papers. Does that happen with the Unistellar Network projects as well? Yeah, we uh, submit uh, first all these observations to AAVL. We announced a partnership with them uh, recently, in fact, in the beginning of this last month. And now we, uh, or AVSO will be the official repository of data collected by the Unistellar uh, network for exoplanets. So our citizen astronomers, when they send us the data, we do the data processing for them. If they, they can also have access to the data and do their own, of course, but we do it for a several pipeline. And when we have a confirmation of a transit, we submit this to the AVSO database with their name on it because they did the observation. So that's completely normal that they have credits for it, of course. 
And then uh, we, for scientific paper, we are working on some of them. In fact, we have so many results that it's getting a bit complicated for us to find times to write papers. So, <laughs> but we are going to take the time in 2022 I hope, to write uh, more of those papers to uh, present the results with the um, Unistellar network. Well, that, that is fantastic. And I am looking forward to those results. And we'll definitely ask you back with some of those citizen astronomers to talk about them here. So thank you again, Franck, for joining us. As always, it's a pleasure to hang out with you. Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you for having me. Thank you. This has been The Daily Space. You can find more information on all our stories, including images, at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the generous donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX.